welcome to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University. I'm your host, Ian, and along with the staff and students at Belgorod State University, I have taken it on myself to try to explain the way Russians educate their children. Give me a child until he is seven, and I will show you the man, is the clumsy but now traditional English version of a phrase that is attributed to Ignatius Loyola a founder of the Jesuits, a fanatical order of mid-16th century Catholics. Loyola was probably quoting Aristotle. This is an iteration of an idea common to all of us, namely that the values and knowledge we instill in our offspring tend to have an all-consuming effect on the minds of the young, shaping their attitudes and actions for the rest of their life in most cases. Like the Jesuits, the Soviets saw education as a form of indoctrination. It is not done to reveal the truth or promote scepticism or inquiry. It is more a question of learning the correct way to live and who you should obey. The problem with this attempt to clone the perfect mind is that life demonstrates its futility. Our desire to fit into our local group of humans and obey authority is matched stride for stride by our incessant childish curiosity and our urge to transgress boundaries. Modern parents and teachers must now balance these desires as the young mind develops. That is never easy and not always successful. In the internet age, the old filters and gatekeepers that controlled our intellectual development have been overwhelmed by a torrent of information from often unreliable and frequently idiotic sources. The ills of internet misinformation affect all of us, but their impact on the young is disproportionate. Attempts to guide young people towards healthy skepticism and critical thinking can lead a quick-witted youngster to question the whole point of education. That said, their lack of courage, wisdom or self-esteem prevents them from quitting, even if they are convinced that school is not for them. Oh yes, and it's against the law. Indoctrination has its place in education, usually at the beginning. In some subjects, it is indispensable. Maths, physics, chemistry and languages have this in common. In order to reach and comprehend the nuances and subtleties, you must first adopt the basics. One and one is two. Velocity is motion in a specific direction. Matter has mass, occupies space and exists in different states that are determined by energy. The Russian for high is privyet. These are the building blocks of knowledge. That is indoctrination. And it is only when we understand these things that we can begin to question them. As we grow up and become less dependent on older people, our experiences will make us question some of these fundamental assumptions, and the results can vary wildly. The moment you realize that Santa may not be a magical being who can pass through solid matter at lightning speed and read your mind, is a moment of confusion, shame, shock and disappointment all rolled into one. When that moment is applied to a deity, it can mean a rejection of reality in favor of magic, or vice versa. When a scientific truth is overturned, it can trigger an extreme emotional response. For me, a good education should soften the blows of life. Few people are gifted, most people are average, and some people need help counting their fingers. But all of them deserve a chance at a happy life. An education is where the tools to accomplish that can best be acquired. Our guest, Inna, says at one point that a good teacher should love their subject and love children. I couldn't agree more when it comes to school. Interestingly though, at university, too much love for your subject will engender unhealthy biases and pointless academic infighting, while too much love for your students tends to mean indulging their intellectual laziness and adopting some of their muddled ideas, if only to be nice and modern. University, at its best, is about slaughtering sacred cows, not nurturing them. I believe that my subject is taught incorrectly and I don't like children. I belong in university. As for my school experience, well, I was raised to run an empire on which the sun never set, and as that empire was no more, I had to fumble around in the dark for a good while before I understood my place in the world. That is a story for my therapist, who is also my best friend and wife. Handy that. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Now for the interview. Dimitri's dulcet tones will feature again, as a while ago he had an interesting time chatting with Inna Tiapugina, who runs our region's most modern school, Algorithm for Success. Even the name is a departure from the norm, as most schools in Russian cities have imaginative-sounding titles like School Number 14, Academy Number 6, or even School Number 1. Hmm. Well, Dimitri is a newly minted teacher himself. He teaches Chinese, believe it or not. I told you my students were smart. And so for him, this interview was like talking to his boss. But then, I imagine having a boss as capable as Inner would be pretty good. We have chosen to translate things into English English, primarily for reasons made clear by my accent. That means that a translation into American English may be beneficial. So here goes. Kindergartens are preschools, primary schools are elementaries, secondary schools are high schools, and a year one pupil is likely a seven-year-old, and a year 11 student is usually 18. 
The head teacher, or head, is the principal. Head can also refer to the head of department, as in head of English. Before we jump in, let's clear up a couple of peculiarities for you. First off, Inna mentions that her school is an all-day school. In Russia, it is common for one school to operate morning and afternoon shifts. This is convenient for the schools as they can double the number of pupils attending a single school building. This is a technique born of necessity. Urban areas in Russia involve a lot of life in flats or apartments for our American listeners. This means that population density in urban areas is quite high and the demand for local convenient schools has to be met. Shifts are the next logical step, but as with any ingenious solution, the results can create a whole new set of issues. In this case, the two main problems are teacher burnout, they can have long days, and varying pick-up and drop-off times for parents, as your little darling's shift will change as they progress through the system. The latter can be a significant problem for parents who do not have a handy grandparent or relative to rely on. Belgorod is a rapidly growing urban area with a large influx of people from former Soviet states in Central Asia, from the troubled regions of Ukraine, and increasingly from Siberia. In effect, this means that their family is more likely to be of the nuclear variety, and often the father still has work in Siberia or Moscow. That requires lengthy periods away from the children. In this context, an all-day school where your little angel is kept off the streets and happily active is a sought-after service. Also, Inna named her feeder schools Ulitka. This is the Russian for snail, which is the name of the part of Dubovoya where her school is. It is called that because from the air, the layout looks a lot like a snail. Dubovoya is a suburb of Belgorod, and it means oak tree place, because it was constructed around a park that is where a very old and legendary oak tree grows. Belgorod means white town, because it is built on chalk bedrock that is revealed in brilliant white wherever you dig a significant hole or where the rivers collapse their banks. Russia means the land of the red-haired people. I don't know anyone with red hair here. While I'm in teaching mode, Inna refers to her feeder preschools as Ulitochki. This means little snails. It works like this. My wife and I have a dog called Isa. My wife loves her very much and so has lengthened her name by inserting an ochk before the last syllable, making it Isachka. These are called diminutives by us linguistic types, but in English we tend to shorten names. William to Bill, for example. However, in the UK we often add a Y to the end of a name. So if I like Bill a lot, I might call him Billy. In this sense, the custom is similar. The dog dog has other names that have a similar meaning, like Aizon, Aizushkin, and Aizonchik. In fact, my wife uses diminutives for everything she likes, from a piece of bread, through her favourite shoes, to her husband, who often has to deconstruct these diminutives to find the Russian for what she is saying. At one point near the end, Inna talks about delicious types of bakery you can eat in Russia. That is another podcast on its own. I should mention that this was recorded in March of 2021, during a lull in the COVID pandemic. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Dmitri started by asking Inna about a typical day in the life of a Russian head teacher. It's very difficult to outline all the responsibilities of a school principal. In the life of a principal, every day involves something completely new, and each day is different in some way. It depends on the children, on the theme of the day, on the topic of the week, perhaps even of the whole month. As for the working day, I'll tell you that at half past seven, I'm already walking around the school, checking in with the administrators and accountants, and making sure that everything is ready. I check to make sure that the canteen has started preparing breakfast and other things like that. Then we greet the children. Our school is very large. It consists of several buildings, so I often spend my mornings in different buildings. I really like to greet the children in the morning, see how they're doing, pick them up if I see that they are a bit down, say hi, make some minor announcements or discuss any issues. I love it when the kids come up to me in the morning and ask a lot of questions. I'll arrange a meeting with them and they ask when they can come and then the magic begins. Everyone goes to their classrooms and everyone gets on with the day. My schedule always includes attending lessons. I think that the main idea is not so much to have a look at the teacher, but to check on the children. I love a kid who thinks, speaks and asks. I also always tell the teachers to let them ask questions. The ability to ask questions, even the desire to ask questions, means that someone is moving forward and that they want to learn something new. When morning lessons are over, then we have lunch and take a stroll. We work as an all-day school, and parents love us for that, and I should point out that we take walks in any kind of weather. Similarly, I always try to go out to the stadium or the playground to see what the kids are up to. It makes it very difficult when adults don't want to make an effort to understand children and children push adults away, so informal communication 
communication outside of a classroom setting, like during breaks, is of great importance. Trust between children and adults is the key to success. That's to say that when the teachers and children return to classes and lessons, and they're talking to each other, I can see that there is trust between them, and trust means knowledge. I absolutely agree with you. I recently graduated and started working as a teacher, and most everything of significance takes place outside of the classroom. Yes, absolutely. I think so too. And despite my vast experience, I still always relate my work to memories of when I was a schoolgirl and a university student. I never forget those days. I'm very grateful to all my teachers. I know that I became a teacher because I had such wonderful teachers in my life. After meeting them, I never thought of any other professions. I knew right away that I was going to be a teacher. But going back to the daily work schedule, after walks and lunch, there are more classes with a different emphasis. We try to build the student's schedule so that both extracurricular activities, that is, additional ones and scheduled ones, are mixed together. We have a non-linear scheduling system. This idea that when lessons are finished, everyone goes home simply does not exist at our school. As the head, my work schedule includes, let's call them, many meetings with my deputies. Each deputy oversees his or her own domain, and there are issues that come up on a daily basis. It's good that now, thanks to social media and all kinds of messenger apps, we can save time and spend it on solving issues. An obligatory part in my daily routine is a visit to the medical center. The nurse and the doctor always tell me what problems there are, what ails the children, what parents have asked them for, and all other associated matters, because the state of the children's health is part of our remit. And the workday usually ends late, around 8 o'clock in the evening. Usually in the evening, when there are fewer people at the school, I work with documents and prepare for the next day. The days fly by like this. How long have you been the head of Algorithm for Success? I've only been working at Algorithm for Success for three years, but I have a long track record in executive level positions. I've been in charge of various organizations. I started as a head of a children's health camp in Belgorod. It's a wonderful camp named after Yuri Gagarin, and I'm glad that the camp is thriving now. Then I was the head of the Regional Center for Children's Arts. It was a unique team, a unique organization, which, in general, was engaged in running supplemental arts-oriented education programs for children children throughout Belgrade's region. We traveled to various municipalities and got to know people in many different organizations, both in small rural schools and large urban ones. I guess I'm trying to do this at my school now as well. The additional program of education at our school, for instance, may last until 8 p.m. Children are offered 16 kinds of sports, and that is alongside all sorts of creative activities like painting, music, singing, and dancing. Every child has the chance to find something that interests them. In the Valentinovna, an all-day school is quite an unusual concept in Russia at the moment, because it's usually arranged so that children come to school and their lessons start at 8 or 8.30, they attend, say, 5, 6 or 7 lessons, and then they leave the school at 2 or 3 and do their homework. After that they can do what they want, that is, they do not stay at school. Some kids attend art or sports clubs, and others hang around the streets or play computer games. But your school works all day. Is it the only one of these types of schools in Belgorod? No. Two years ago, so, Belgrade region opted into a wonderful strategy called kind schooling. The concept is very broad and really is very extensive. And one of the projects of the strategy is the introduction of the all-day school. Not all schools are able to do it for various reasons, but a lot of urban and rural schools in our region have introduced it. Some schools offer it for elementary school students, others for middle and senior students. I mean, every school does what suits its circumstances, but there are several basic requirements. For Foremost is the staffing. There must be specialists in all areas, teachers of all subjects who are all qualified. All material and technical criteria must be met. I mean, at an all-day school, the afternoon always consists of extracurricular activities and supplemental classes. It's the child's choice. If you want to offer robotics, for example, you must be sure that you can provide your students with decent learning conditions. Moreover, it's one thing to teach entry-level robotics, but an entirely different different thing to teach it at higher levels. Our school is brand new, it's only three years old. We incorporated recruitment and selection of personnel into the basic concept of our school. There are people 
people who are skilled and knowledgeable and they understand that working all day really means. The kids really like it. It means they can schedule their journey through the whole day by themselves. There are individual learning plans for seniors, for children if they go to music schools, art schools or sports schools. We always find something else for them to do at school. That is, the child's schedule is organized every day for the whole day. At least we set it up until six, and this is covered with not only our resources, but also the resources of other organizations. Also, parents understand where, when and how they need to take part, and we, the school, knows what the kid likes. If they, for example, attend painting classes at school, we understand the level of this child. It's a pleasure working with such children. You're listening to Understanding Russia. I'll be honest with you, I've had and still have students from Algorithm for Success. They're really bright and talented kids who are always doing something, always busy and engaged in something. Is your school, Algorithm for Success, private or public? Our school is a public school, and the education and training are absolutely free. All the creative and sports clubs and departments and the supplemental classes, they're also absolutely free. I misspoke. I meant, is it part of the municipality? Does it belong to the city? No. There are two types of schools, private and municipal. The last ones are usually founded by a municipal district or a city. We geographically belong to the Belgorod Municipal District. We are located in a rural area in the village of Dubovoye. And we have public school status because we were set up by the Belgorod Regional Department for Education. That is, we are a regional school. And we are a key school and a resource center. That means that, in addition to the fact that we work independently with our teachers, we also work with the teachers of Belgorod region and with children from other schools. In effect, we share our resources, hold joint events, seminars and webinars now. We learn from each other. And our status in the region is a key resource school. There are 1,300 students in the school and 250 in the kindergarten. 1,550 in total. Our educational complex in includes a kindergarten. It's located in two buildings. In fact, these are two kindergartens, but in one. We call them Ulitka 1 and Ulitka 2. We're close to beginning construction on the third Ulitka. And there are two primary schools. They're also separate. They're all located nearby. We're in a unique residential area called Ulitka, and Algorithm for Success, our secondary school, is in the center. Residential neighborhood are being built around it in a spiral shape, like a snail shell. And each apartment block has access to a primary school and a kindergarten for younger children. And then they fit in to a secondary school. If you live in Ulitka, there is always a kindergarten and a primary school within walking distance for the little ones. And there is one big secondary school for the older kids. There will be eight Ulitkas in the future. And there will be a sizable snail, shell-shaped residential area, a whole neighborhood, a whole city around the school. School. The secondary school works with older children from 12 to 18, and all the kindergartens and primary schools for younger children will be Ulitichki. So it turns out that although they are located very close to each other, they are still separated. Kindergartens, of course, are separate, and the primary school is separate from the secondary. That is, everything is separate, right? In the secondary school at the moment, we have primary and secondary students, because we don't have enough secondary age pupils. The younger ones do have lessons in our primary school and some lessons in the secondary school block, but they have their own dedicated school block. Our school complex consists of six separate blocks, but all all of them are connected to each other, architecturally and geographically. The primary school blocks has its own separate entrance, its own changing areas, that is. It's an area reserved for small children. I have to tell our listeners that this is a very unusual picture of an ordinary Russian school, because in general all students from 7 to 18 study in the same school, in the same building. So you're not really into that model, you're for separating them out, right? You know, it's not really about separation, but you can't separate primary from secondary pupils completely. They definitely need to learn how to adapt. Since we have only two schools so far, we have it so that after finishing year two, the children move to the secondary school in year three, and there will be new first years in the primary school. That is, they go through a kind of acclimatization in their own world, and they have their own timetable. First years have shorter classes, they last 30 minutes each, while the older pupils have 
have 40-minute classes, and they have their own breaks. That is, they're eased into the system gradually. Naturally, it's easier for them to adapt when they are accommodated separately. And then, year three or four, they move to the large school, and naturally, they interact on an equal footing with older students. The secondary syllabus begins in year five, and then it just goes on as normal. So you say that there is no tuition fees regarding the timetable. Do your lessons start at 8 in the morning? At 8.30. And how long does a child spend at school on average? Little ones, I mean primary pupils from years 1 to 4, they stay in classes until 4. They're with their teacher, that's their timetable. Then from 4 to 6 they have extracurricular activities. They work with tutors and with teachers and they can go to art clubs and classes and have playtime. Then from 6 to 8 they have sports clubs and classes. But those are for the older ones, I would say. Secondary classes end generally at quarter past 5. Then things are the same, classes and clubs until 8. But if a student has their own timetable, they organize it themselves. So lessons are from 8.30 to 5. If you attend additional clubs or classes, it's from 8.30 to 8. So you basically spend the whole day at school. Mm, and during this period of time, all the pupils from 7 to 18 have breaks and meals. Yes, three meals a day. We have a separate children's cafe. You can go there and have a snack at any time, even in the evening after all the main meals. We always do our best to feed the children well. And we're probably different in comparison to other schools in terms of, for example, for breakfast we have lots of dairy. Then for lunch we use a buffet system. We offer children a good choice of food. And our buffet is not similar to what everyone is used to in hotels and the like, because we have to control the children's food intake, their diet, that's to say proteins, fats and carbohydrates. They're all necessary for good health. So, for example, we always have two kinds of soups for the first course. The child chooses the one they prefer. For side dishes, we cook three of them. So the vegetable options we offer might be potato, cabbage or vegetable stew. And they all go with fish, for example. Fish day is not the children's favorite day. For some reason, all our children dislike fish. I think maybe that fish is something Something you begin to appreciate only in adulthood. How do we solve this problem? Children need to eat fish, and they should... Well, I won't go into the benefits of fish, we all know them. So we offer fish fingers, fish baked with vegetables, and fish rissoles. The kids will have to choose something from the selection in any case, and that means that they are sure to eat their share of fish. We always make sure to give them enough food and vegetables. Dairy products are an integral part of their diet as well. If you look at their diet for the whole day, you'll see that the amount of food they are provided with is sufficient for them to feel good. This is a healthy diet. The meals are mostly steamed. Modern machines allow us to do this. We try to avoid frying in oil. Fats are a no-no. That's not an option. In the end, a healthy diet is a guarantee that the child will feel well and there won't be any gastrointestinal track disorders. Meals are served three times a day. They eat often and no one is hungry, of course. And I'd like to know that absolutely all our students have their meals in our school's cafeteria. Are meals paid or free? Meals are paid for. The children get their breakfast at the state's expense. That's 50 rubles, around 60 cents, for a dairy-based breakfast. Next, lunch and an afternoon snack are paid for by the parents. In many schools and in ours, there are different menus for the younger and older kids, and we offer slightly different dishes. And the price varies as well. Now lunches in secondary school cost at most 110 rubles per day around $1.50. So that's 50 rubles for breakfast, which is paid for by the state, and 110 rubles for everything else, which is lunch and an afternoon snack. Yes, those are paid for by the parents. That's the only fee that we charge, school meals. You said you also have a children's cafe, which means if the food didn't fill me up, I can go there and buy something with my own money, right? Yes, absolutely. Our children's cafe is called The Cube. It works in the same way as any catering service. The only thing we don't allow children to have, the thing that we allow only adults to have, and by mutual agreement, is coffee. That is, there is a coffee machine and adults, teachers can use it, but children can't. 
They can have hot chocolate, tea, fruit drinks, and stuff like that. There are pastries and chocolate as well. There are certain restrictions in the children's cafe. That is, there are no salads, no meat products, nothing like that. When you want to have a snack, you can buy a bun, some tea, or some chocolate. But in spite of all the restrictions, a lot of children still go there. We called it the Cube. That name was invented by the kids, and it opened a short while ago, about six months ago. Everyone interprets its name in their own way. It's an abbreviation, and all letters are in uppercase. We included Rubik's cubes and puzzles in our school's design. There are brain teasers on every shelf. The children love solving them, and now they are demanding new ones. I think we will definitely buy some for them, because while a child is resting, they talk to each other, and at the same time, their fingers are working on these puzzles. This develops their fine motor skills, their logic, and that's great. You're listening to Understanding Russia. How many full-time teachers do you have? There are 70 teachers. They're our core workers. Besides them, there are other teaching staff, psychologists, social educators and tutors. We have children with disabilities, including children who use wheelchairs, and there are individual tutors who work with them. I'd like to note that our school is a barrier-free environment, so children with musculoskeletal system disorders can study without any trouble. We always give them a warm welcome, and they feel absolutely at ease at our school. Even in our pool and in the gym there are special facilities for differently able children. Could you please list the factors that, in your opinion, make your school stand out from other schools in Belgorod region? You know, when it comes to what's different about us, what we can be proud of, of course, the architecture and the design, the unique design. The credit goes, of course, to the construction company, which was interested in building such a school. It was built using a public-private partnership. That is, there was both state money and private money, so all the equipment was bought and installed according According to the architectural concept of the school. Are we somehow unique and fundamentally different from other schools in the Belgrade region? No. Every school is its own state, its own world. And these mini-worlds build their own teams which are composed of children, teachers and parents. The atmosphere depends on what kind of world they want to create. We are creating a world now. Our world is only three years old. Our organization is in its infancy, but we have set very ambitious goals. Of course, we want to be among the best the best in learning, the best at sports, and the most creative. These are all good goals, but the most important goal of our team is that every child at school should be happy. Every child achieves happiness in an idiosyncratic way, and creating an environment in which everyone of our 1,300 pupils feels good is our main task. If a child does not want to go to the blackboard and answer the teacher's questions, no one will make them. We give every child a chance to prove what they think is true, to argue their point, even if it seems to us that they are utterly mistaken. We want everyone to be able to perform on stage, to take part in competitions, to organize their own personal presentations according to our algorithm for success. That's what the staff are here for. We are ready to support everyone. For example, the exhibitions at our library and information center change regularly, with new photos and drawings being displayed. Some are pretty good, some are pretty ordinary, but it doesn't matter, because you can do it, you did it, and here's your show, your exhibition, and you can probably Probably bring your classmates and you tell them what technique you used, or whether you were just learning to draw, or tell them that you really like fairy tales and decided to draw illustrations to some works of art. I mean, the main task is to give every child the opportunity to explore themselves and open up. As for specifics in terms of education and organization, I think those are probably the same in every school. So when I hear that kids want to go to our school and their parents ask me how they can get their child into our school, I understand that we're probably probably moving in the right direction. When we first opened, there were 400 students, and we invited everyone. According to the plan, we should have 1,100 students. That's our capacity. Now we're full and even over full, and there are still many students who want to study at our school. And that's probably the most important indicator that kids want to go to our school, and their parents want them to study there. This means that we're on the right track. 1,300 students, that's a very large school for Russia. 
Yes. As for the design, since you've mentioned it, who's responsible for the design of algorithm for success? You know, the project is unique. It's the product of a design institute and Belgorodstruy Montage, a group of construction companies that also has its own in-house design institute built to school. I mean, they created the project and constructed it together. Vadim Klet, the founder of the group of companies, is a wonderful man. He's the driving force behind the school, the creator of the project, who, as I understand it, made a conscious decision to build such an awesome school. The uniqueness of the architecture project is that we have a huge number of free recreation facilities and areas. We don't have narrow hallways. There are only broad spaces, halls, recreational areas, and children feel free outside the classrooms. They can ship furniture and rearrange and organize the classrooms as they want. Color and light are fundamental. Our school is full of yellows and oranges. The Ministry of Education requires that schools in our country use neutral tones because they do not cause distractions. Our classrooms are colored in accordance to this requirement, but recreational rooms and spaces are colorful. One area is green, another is yellow, and third is blue. Blue is for the humanities, literature, languages, history, and the like. The orange area is probably the most energetic. It's for those who study math, physics, and chemistry. The color green means foreign languages, and that's where the primary school kids like to play. Those are the three basic training blocks, and our emblems are designed in exactly the same style. Yes, we also have unique emblems. As for the colors, I'd like to add that all our floors are white. We have white tiles interspersed with the color of the corresponding zone. This surprises many people because, yes, well, it's school, and there's constant toing and throwing, and how many children are running about there. But the tiles are white, always white. We try to keep things clean. And one more thing that may make us different from other schools, well, there used to be a habit, and you, Dmitri, maybe you have seen it too when you were at school. Kids clean up after themselves. It's a natural thing, though. A while ago, schools dropped this idea, assuming the children shouldn't be the ones to do it. But we made it one of our rules, right from the start. Students from 12 to 18 clean their own classrooms. They mop the floor, tidy up, and not with modern vacuum cleaners. Children should know how to use a broom and a mop and understand that cleanliness depends on no one but themselves and that they should take care of it. And in the canteen, too, children of all ages help set the table for lunch and clean up after having meals. In the canteen, when they're on duty, when I go there at the end of the day and ask questions, they say it's really hard, seeing how hard it is for the cooks canteen workers and the whole team to provide them with quality food, children learn to appreciate the work that goes into this, and their attitude changes. They don't want to litter, throw stuff, and spoil things anymore. That's, I guess, conscious education. And as for the project itself, of the 18,000 square meters of four and a half acres, that is the entire territory of the school, 5,000 of them, or one and a fifth acres, are for recreational use. Just count the recreational facilities. There are couches and soft seats where students can sit and relax. This creates a sense of comfort and ease for the children. The design of our school also includes a huge gym. You know that it's one of the largest school gyms in the Belgrad region, and that allows us to host professional competitions and rhythmic gymnastics. And its height allows us to hold volleyball competitions as well. I mean, the height of the gym allows us to not only have training sessions, but also host serious competitions. There are swimming pools, two wonderful swimming pools, and a 25 meter athletic track and a smaller track for primary kids. And there's the health club type facilities. We have an amazing and wonderful room, a salt therapy room like in health centers. Children who study at our school, for whom this therapy is recommended by doctors, attend sessions in this room where they inhale salt vapors. This strengthens your immune system and protects you from all kinds of acute respiratory infections and colds. It helps a lot. There's a sauna in the swimming pool area. The sauna is for the athletes for contrast body tempering. Everyone who's engaged in swim training goes through the sauna. This is very important. All these facilities were included in our school's design from the very beginning. That is, when the concept of the school was being created, they focused on the necessities for health living, as well as for education. And that's why we ended up with such a unique architectural project. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Is there a leading area of study in your school?
I suppose there are some leading areas in our secondary school which are emerging three years after we started teaching. One of them is medical classes. Medical classes are focused on studying maths, biology and chemistry. The key subjects here are biology and chemistry, which are what future doctors need. Such classes are offered to pupils from the age of 12. That is, in year 5, children choose their pre-training program to prepare for their specialization. In addition to the basic lessons, which are the same for all year 5, pupils, the student chooses their own area of study to focus on. There can be the basics of medicine, any aspect of it. It's introductory in nature. From year 7, they begin to study chemistry and biology in more depth. During years 10 and 11, every student has their own specialized individual curriculum. The second most popular area of study is IT. We look at it this way. It starts in kindergarten. Legal construction, the ability to set an algorithm for action. This is probably what any good programmer should learn. As we say, he who learns to write code masters the world. After legal construction, we move on to robotics. Robotics, with all its offshoots like prototyping, 3D modeling and printing, that's one whole block, and the children are very interested in it, and were the first ones to introduce artificial intelligence classes. Well, maybe now some schools in our region have them too. We've already introduced them in order to teach children from a technical point of view, for them to understand understand that artificial intelligence, I mean, there's a kind of a spiritual and moral component to it. We need to understand why we're creating this and what foundations we're laying. Artificial intelligence classes are for children who already have a high level of knowledge in programming. We require our teachers to know at least five programming languages, and they teach the children the languages they know. So there's IT training in our school. Although it's not for everyone, but those who chose IT are very fond of what is taught. Besides those, we love foreign languages. We're probably unique in that our students learn a lot of foreign languages. English is compulsory for all children from year 2 to year 11, and a second foreign language is optional. We offer German, French, and Chinese. The children also like Spanish when it's taught during workshop sessions. We work alongside your respected and beloved university. There are Italian workshops too, and there is a demand from children and adults now for the Korean language. And I understand I understand that my task now as a leader is to find a Korean language teacher. We would be willing to open such classes at our school as well. Who studies for languages? Usually, these are students who study the humanities, things like history, social studies and economics. And we introduce courses in high school that we believe will be useful to the children. For example, we have a course called Chinese Language for Business. We're aware that Chinese is now ubiquitous and everyone should know its basics. The course is a kind of an introduction to Chinese, so that learners will be able to do business in this language. French and German are studied, but to a lesser extent. We recently, just two weeks ago actually, conducted a survey of our year five parents. A lot of them want their kids to learn Chinese, so it's in great demand now, and we'll see what we can do to keep up with it. Well, as for German and French, we received requests specifically for French language classes. By the way, we try, I mean, before all the COVID-19 restrictions, our French teachers traveled abroad and had practical training. They were in Morocco just before the pandemic. So, you see, we try to support our teachers in maintaining a high level of competence so that they can teach our students with the best available knowledge. Beginning from year five and even from the first year in some cases, children have the opportunity to go into some subjects in more depth. As you said, IT is taught from year one, but students choose their own specialization only after year nine, don't they? Yes, from year five there is a preparation program. And from year seven, the students begin to learn certain subjects in more depth, the ones that are required by their specialization. Physics and math groups always go together with IT groups, because physics, maths and computer sciences are absolutely inseparable. For example, there may be five groups in our secondary school, and one class is attended by all the children together, and then they go their separate ways, since every student learns a particular subject at their own level. This is very important for advanced students. It's specialized training, and younger pupils, when they pick the subjects for the future specialization and give it a try, they can understand quickly whether it's for them. In year five, everyone wants to become a doctor, but 
when they begin to learn advanced chemistry in year 7, many realize that it's not that easy. Then anatomy begins. By the way, we work very well with and are very grateful to Belgorod State University's Magical Institute because they provide us with the means to train practical skills with teachers, simulation centers and medical classes. That's the kind of cooperation we have from them. So could you go into how your school prepares students for the basic and the unified state examinations? As far as I understand it, even senior students stay at school until late, so they have less free time in comparison to students from other schools. Usually, students have six or seven classes at school, and then they have to take supplemental lessons with private tutors. Do your students need tutors, or are lessons at school enough for them to be ready for their final exams? I'm absolutely confident in saying that over the past three years we have created a system that fully prepares our students for the unified state exam. I always recommend that parents, I openly tell them at parents' meetings, to let their children study according to the program that we offer them. First of all, there are lessons which provide them with basic knowledge of certain subjects. If we take, for example, maths, there are at least two elective additional courses that involve more in-depth training, extra curricular activities go along with these courses. It's the kind of program that broadens one's horizons, offers some unusual non-standard tasks, and more besides. The Unified State Exam is not only about training to complete typical tasks. You need to understand the system, to know how things are done and solved. Then we offer our assistance. For instance, if a student studies and respects their math teacher, but can't understand some topic because of the way their teacher explains it, they go to another teacher's lesson lessons that they also like. Each teacher has an hour of consulting work, where children from different classes can come to them. There may be students from years 9, 10 or 11. Children can often understand one teacher but not follow another, although the material they explain is the same. The second thing we offer kids is, for example, there is usually one math teacher for the whole of year 11, but there is a consultation timetable. It involves at least three teachers, so one teacher is a specialist in geometry, another works on problem solving and the third works on examples. The children can get information from different teachers. We guarantee good results and we see the level of the student. All the teachers interact with each other. They know what every kid needs to improve. It happens quite often that students fail the geometry part in maths during the unified state exam. For some reason, it appears to be a tough task for every single student. Apparently, not everyone has good spatial awareness and would understand that this part needs to be studied harder. When there are several teachers and we see the situation from all angles, we can solve this problem and we can tell the child what they need to do. External tutoring has not been banned by us, but no one can guarantee its quality. It's a paid service, so you pay and the tutor teaches, then leaves. Parents are happy as long as their child is doing something. We always advise them to go to supplemental classes at school first and then decide whether they need private tutors or not. I'll give you one example. Last year, some of our students took the unified state exam in computer science. This is an optional exam. All the children who worked with our teachers, according to the system that the school offered, successfully passed the exam, but those who preferred private tutors unfortunately did not achieve such good results. You're listening to Understanding Russia. So there's no need for tutors? Is the recruitment and selection of teachers strict? I get asked this question often. Before COVID, we often had visitors. They came to us, had a look at the whole project and how we organized everything, how we started our work, and they always asked questions about our teachers. As a head teacher, I adhere to two basic principles. The first and most important thing for a teacher is a love for children. Love for children can't be replaced with any skills. A good teacher loves children, wants to work with them, and is ready to do absolutely everything for people success. The second criterion is knowledge of their subject and a love for it. If a person loves children and loves literature, for example, then success is 100% assured as a literature teacher. One of the mandatory requirements in the selection of teachers is their ability to work with computers and to work with all kinds of electronic applications. We have a lot of young teachers. We recruit many recent university and college graduates. There are specialists who start teaching with almost no experience 
experience, but then they master it and we're part of them. And there are many experienced teachers who have 25 to 30 years of teaching experience. It was difficult for them to switch to electronic systems of education, but the main thing here is the desire. We're often called the first digital school in Russia. We stand on three pillars. No other school in the Belgrade region has this. Older children starting from year four stop using paper textbooks altogether. We work with electronic textbooks only. Children come to school, hand in their mobile phones and get tablets or laptops in exchange and work with them all day. When it's time for them to go home, they hand in the tablets and laptops, take their phones and leave. So we have three systems. The first is our virtual school, which includes grade books, assignment books and marks. The system even keeps track of students' nutrition. It also includes cashless payment for meals. Each child has their own personal account. The second system is called Lekta, which contains all our textbooks in their electronic form. It includes works from various publishing houses. What is an electronic version of a textbook? Well, it's not just a copy of it. There are all sorts of hyperlinks, maps and additional material. This is a huge resource. Another resource that we're working with is one we consider unique. It's called MEO, Mobile Electronic Education, and it's a system that gives children, adults and teachers access to an enormous amount of material. For example, let's take the works of Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. We study him in years 5 to 7. If I open up the Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin resource, I will find everything in there, from archive materials and video and audio materials, to simple assignments for children who have learning difficulties, as well as complex assignments for gifted children. There are practice tests for the state exams and even for competitions. It's sheer pleasure for a teacher to plan lessons with the system. There's no need to search the internet for different fragments of the opera Eugene Onegin or some author's performance or something. It's all already in the system. You just need to build the lesson. Main thing is to have a computer. I think it's normal for modern kids. Everyone has a computer nowadays. We gave some kids laptops for them to use at home. We help those who have trouble with access. When everything was shut down because of quarantine, we switched to distance learning with ease. We're very versatile. It hasn't caused us any problems at all. We took to the systems like a duck to water. Neither the children nor their parents had any problems using the material. This situation showed that we are one step ahead of the game. Now we have switched back to full-time, face-to-face teaching, but we've left certain days for distance learning. We introduced mixed teaching. Children spent four days studying at school and one one day studying at home. The timetable wasn't fixed, so a teacher could have the first lesson at school and the second online. They log into the system, work with children, give them assignments and receive feedback. It's very convenient. Previously, it took me the whole lesson to listen to children reading the poems that they learned by heart, but now children attach audio files and I can listen to them anywhere, give them their mark and leave comments. Students do their home assignments, write them in a notebook, take a photo of it, upload the file and I can see it by the way. But not being afraid to try to work online is also one of our teachers' great skills. Onwards and upwards. Few people have the courage to do it, but we do. These days people come to us from all over Russia to see how we do it, and it inspires them to progress. I know you stuck with a mixed system for a while, where kids went to school most of the time, but studied from home one day every week. Are you still doing that? We did it from last year's September to this year's April. We have cancelled it because we're on the home stretch now. These are the last months, then there's finals work and preparation for exams. We made the decision after careful deliberation. The circumstances are much more favorable now since the peak of COVID-19 infections has passed. Now our students study at school all week instead of the mixed system that existed from September to April. If the situation with COVID-19 remains the same or gets worse, do you plan to reintroduce remote studying in September? If it's necessary, of course, yes. Why was it even necessary? According to all the advice, you were allowed to work five days a week at school even earlier, before you stopped distance learning, but you still kept one day for distance learning every week. Why? 
I suppose we had two main objectives. First of all, despite everything, the restrictive measures prescribed by COVID regulations obliged us to introduce a flexible timetable, meaning that children had to be at school at different times. We also set up additional entrances and exits to cloakrooms. Our task was to minimize the risks of contact in each building or area of the school. Secondly, we understand that the situation may get worse any time, not only during the coronavirus pandemic, but even in peaceful times. Flu is still around, it never disappeared. Children may be quarantined for weeks. We understood that children, parents and teachers need to get used to the mixed system of learning and that the skills of working remotely are necessary and will never go back to the purely in-person system. University students study remotely, people work remotely. We can see how fast organizations are rearranging their employees' work. This is today's reality. There is no doubt that when this pandemic ends, all this won't just go away. There will be no turning back. The ability to accustom children to such a system, the ability to work in it, to speak into the microphone, take videos, or to let other people see you, and so on, everyone should know how to do that. This was a part of our task, too. Do your students have the chance to interact with students from other countries? Yes, I have a striking example. Every Thursday, no matter what, our Year 7 students interact with their peers from South Carolina, USA. They go on Skype and they chat. Our kids Kids love it, and I can also see that American kids find it amusing too. The children discuss children's issues. When Christmas and the New Year were approaching, we discussed who liked what gifts, how children would spend their vacation, what books they would read, what movies they usually watched. They really found some common ground. The most important thing here is to understand that these children are the same. There are no borders in their world. We have an English-speaking club called World Without Borders. Students from different years groups can go there. It all depends on how well they speak the language. For example, we have a girl who lived in Canada for many years. She's in year two and speaks English fluently. It's her native language. She attends lessons with students in years nine and ten and has no trouble because she needs to maintain her level. The most important thing during our Skype meetings is speaking. The program for learning foreign languages is a little undercooked. There's not enough conversation, so communication with children from other countries is a good way out. We always set up meetings with students when we could, with Chinese students, with everyone. We want our children to communicate, to speak with native speakers. They become more interested in learning foreign languages, and their level goes up. You're listening to Understanding Russia. Maybe it's too early to ask this question, as the school has only just opened. The borders are closed because of the global pandemic, but it's still interesting. Do you have any plans to foster academic mobility and exchange programs? In our first year, we managed to organize two trips to language summer camps. That was before COVID. The children went to Malta and to Sweden. They practiced English there. I would also like to say that we have a parents' association. The association is made up of parents who are willing to help our children. The association is not directly a part of the school, but there is also a charity fund run by Vadim Kret, who I've already mentioned. It is called Our Children. This foundation has helped children to travel abroad, as well as that, we have scholarships for our students. A successful student receives a scholarship. It's awarded twice a year for a half a year period in these areas, for academic studies, for sports, and for creative work. Any child from years 4 to 11 can be awarded a scholarship. Similarly, there is a scholarship for teachers, a grant to support the best teachers. It is set every six months. Teachers have a very good semi-annual grant of 100,000 rubles, around $1,400. We've been testing this system for three years now. There have already been six such groups of teachers. We had plans to go to India, and we discussed a few different options. I think that with the help of the Parents' Association, we can develop and support a foundation so that children can go abroad for language practice. The scholarship amounts to 4,000 rubles a month, around $55. It runs for half a year, so the total sum is 16,000 rubles. A teacher gets 100,000 rubles for half Half a year. The money is paid in equal shares over five months. It is a monthly payment. Everyone has a chance to get it. People are always asking about it. Could a child get a scholarship of their great athlete but have poor marks in maths? What's the value of the scholarships that are offered in your school? Yes, they can. There is a crucial factor at play. Children determine the scholarship winners themselves. They decide who will apply for the scholarship. It may be one or two students per class. 
A large council of children is assembled. There are no adults there, just an organizer and a teacher who works with them. The children decide for themselves. This is also very important because children learn to ask the right questions. Sometimes they don't approve of some students' performance. They point out to the student that they need to brush up on their math or something. The children make a list of candidates, and we organize the teachers' meeting and discuss it. Generally, the teachers agree with the children's choices. Right now, there are 37 children and five teachers on the list. The number of children fluctuates. Usually, it's up to 50, no more than that. But there's a certain quota. We determine the maximum. The most important thing in the Soviet school system was the attitude towards the child as an individual. I went to Soviet school and graduated from teacher training in Soviet times. Attitude, education, training, and moral upbringing. A teacher in Soviet times was the role model for a child along with the child's parents. Now everything is changing. Children absorb more information. They have the internet, there's no need to explain. I will never be able to compete with modern technology. It's not a competition. If you're trying to teach, you'll understand what I mean. Our goal is to teach them the basics. What is good, what is bad. Humanity is crucial at any time, no matter what era we live in. The task of every teacher is to bring out diligence in a child. Studying at university is also hard work. Let's talk about outstanding Soviet educators. For me, as a future teacher, it was important to maintain high standards. A good example would be Anton Semenovich Makarenko. He was a teacher who taught difficult children who lacked even the basics of how to communicate and work together. There was a lot to learn there. Vasily Alexandrovich Sukomlinsky used to teach the basics of ethics, respect for elders, and honoring one's family. And so in our school, I try to transmit this mindset to young teachers so they can keep this tradition of humanity in our children. And even when a student gets a bottom mark, that doesn't give a teacher the right to humiliate them. There are the rules of conduct I'm trying to maintain. I know that many schools practice the same thing. It's called patriotic education. It's not some flashy one-off fad. Patriotism is fostered when you respect and help your grandparents and parents. This is patriotism. It starts in the family, at school, with respect for elders, and your attitude towards other people's work. This way, a child will grow up to become a big-hearted person. This is probably every teacher's dream and aspiration. What do you imagine a modern school in Russia will look like by the time you retire? Schools will be very dynamic, very fast-paced. The world is moving faster now. We can see that. But despite the pace, the new technology, the new subjects, we understand that academic education is one thing, but the ability to acquire soft skills is another important aspect in any child's education. And then there's versatility, mobility, changeability, interchangeability, teachability, a mix of blended learning. That's probably what the future holds for schools. However, I can say one thing with confidence. No no artificial intelligence can replace the teacher. The personality of the teacher is the most important thing in any school. The school of the future is a versatile school. It is a versatile school, but with the presence of a teacher. So at the end of the conversation, we always ask our guests what they like about our country's culture the most. I was born in Ukraine. I consider myself Ukrainian. I graduated from a Ukrainian school, but later became interested in Russian language and literature. I enrolled in the teacher training college in Kharkov to study it, and all of my relatives speak Ukrainian. It's my mother tongue, but I was attracted to the culture of Russia. In my opinion, Russian literature is a milestone in our country's culture. Dostoevsky and Tolstoy his novels are translated into many different languages. It is something unique. It's a dialogue about a man, about his inner world, his thoughts, his aspirations. It's probably easy to create an essay or a short story or write about some adventure or shoot a short film, but to show the essence of a person is another thing. That's probably the most important thing that is inherent in Russian culture. Our classical music, our art, our literature. I'm sure that there is nothing better than that. This is what Russian culture is based on. Maybe there are some traditional customs that you would like to highlight or some typical traits. Traditional? Hmm. Well, perhaps my favorite thing is the cuisine. I can't say that Russian cuisine has any distinct features like Italian or Japanese, but in general, I would say that bread is the major component in Russian culture. Bread, pirashki, kulibaka, pierogies, pancakes, and other types of stuffed pastry. There is a certain respect towards bread in Russian culture. There are so many delicious pastries. The stuffing varies from sweet to salty. We're near Easter now, and people 
people are making kurichi, a type of Easter cake. It's our tradition. People prepare for weeks to make their own type of dough. My mother is already quite old, and she sent me pictures of her kulichi yesterday. I realized that no matter how old she is, she'll cook them to keep our traditions alive. I have to follow her example. I don't always bake kulichi for Easter, but there's a tradition I love. Pierogies for the Russian Old New Year. I pride myself on being able to make very tasty pierogies. On Russian Old New Year, all my friends get together and, move, and we make pierogies. I suppose the love for traditions is a feature of our national mentality. And what do you like the least? Slackness and inaction I hate the most. I sometimes feel very uncomfortable on weekends and holidays. I can't stop thinking about my work. Sometimes it's hard, but I understand that I need to rest. I exercise as much as I can. I play table tennis, I swim, I go skiing. I guess I don't like inactivity in the broad sense. A human should always be busy doing something. Uh, we were talking about children. An old day school has to keep a child busy to let them test themselves. You have to let them try drawing, football, swimming, anything. It'll help them develop their character and stamina. Idleness is off-putting. It's not interesting to be around idle people. For example, I play table tennis. I started playing when I was very young, and my brother and me used to sit on the floor and play. I almost reached the level of candidate master at it. And now I hold the school principal's cup. We have a table tennis club. Table tennis is popular in our school. We hold a competition and children, parents and teachers all take part. We have a huge trophy that is passed from champion to champion. I always play against the finalists. The highest placed pupil wins the cup. By the way, a group of children is now at competitions in Moscow and St. Petersburg. I am proud that as a girl I had an opportunity opportunity to play at my school. This is something that became a habit with me. This is something that stuck with me. And that's why I do not like an activity. Mm -hmm. I don't know how often you travel abroad. Still, could you outline some positive things in other cultures that would be useful for our culture to adopt? I haven't been to a lot of countries, unfortunately. But then again, we often travel virtually via our phones and computers. Understanding where I would like to go probably determines the culture I want to see and experience. Top of the list is Japan. Visiting Japan is my dream. This is probably inspired by books, paintings and Japanese philosophy in general. You cannot bring it into Russian culture. Any adopted elements from other countries' cultures are purely superficial. This is why it's impossible to integrate something into to our culture. Learning from it is another thing. I would learn wisdom and fortitude from the Japanese, and a laissez-faire attitude from the French. For some reason, I want to go to Australia. It's a unique continent. It's unusual in terms of geography and nature, but I imagine it is a green and vibrant place despite all the sand. It's hard to say how Australian culture is different from others, but I'm drawn to geography. The culture cannot stand by itself. Country's geography plays a major role in it. Also, I would like to visit Northern Europe. Europe, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Switzerland, and Norway, of course. But in Russia we have Kamchatka. It's located near Japan. I think the proximity of it has an impact of people who live in Kamchatka. Khabarovsk is very close to China. Murmansk and Arkhangelsk are northern regions. You can meet a Viking while visiting Arkhangelsk. These are the countries I would like to visit. Thank you for listening to Understanding Russia. If you want to contact us, you can get in touch with us via our website at urpod.net, where you can find all our social media links, or via email, understandingrussia at gmail.com. We will be very happy to hear from you. You have been listening to Understanding Russia, a student-led podcast from Belgorod State University.